Okay, friends, once again, welcome to the second day of the ITSBR Congress. Um, the first session, therapy session, is on basic income and political action. What does it take to transform an idea into policy? I think most of you are familiar with the journey, which is not easy, the difficult journey from the time an idea emerges in a group or in the university or actors uh, from the community. And to bring that to the notice of, first of all, the citizens, and then influence and convince the politicians. Since the time we did the pilot study, we have been in the, that process. And I must say, what has happened in India is beyond, has been beyond our expectations. So, in this session, this session Barbara Jacobson is going to chair. All of, most of you know Barbara Jacobson. Barbara has been with the basic movement for more than 15, 20 years. And she's uh, from the PM UK. Okay, welcome everyone to the first session of the second day of this wonderful Congress. Um, this is really about uh, political action and the fact that basic income is not just a pretty idea anymore. It's something that we're trying to get implemented um, and spread around our various countries and regions. Um, so, yeah, so I'd like to just move on quickly to our panelists. We have uh, Lee J. Myung from, Korea, from South Korea, the, governess, the governor of Yongin province, and he's managed to implement a youth dividend in his area. Um, very good. We also have Eduardo Suplicy from Brazil, who is a civic councillor in Sao Paulo. Uh, he was the force behind the implementation of Bolsa Familia and getting basic income into the Brazilian constitution. Okay, and then at the very end we have Larry Cohen who is the founder of Build the Floor and is active in Andrew Yang's presidential campaign. Andrew Yang has uh, proposed a freedom dividend and is uh, going great guns in the U.S. with the campaign now. And we have Karen Juist. Is that Juist? Juist. We have Karen Juist from South Africa. She's a member of Poland. Or was a member of parliament, yeah, um, active in the opposition party, and is very much pushing for basic income to be uh, part of their manifesto and some of their offer. And then, last but not least, of course, we have Alexander de Roo, who uh, is a member of the Green Party in the Netherlands and a former member of the European Parliament, and is uh, working very hard in the Netherlands uh, to get people together on the subject. Okay, so first, uh, we're going to take some short statements, about 10 minutes each, if people have them. Um, don't feel obliged. <laughs> this was supposed to sort of run as a discussion, and, you know, in the way of all things, we things kind of get changed at the very last moment. That's fine. Uh, so, if we could have the presentation from, from Mr. Myung, and first, and then Eduardo Suplicy, next. And Alexander next, and Karen, if you want to do your that next. I don't know, Andrew, if you've got a statement, or sorry, uh, Larry, if you've got a statement. Okay, five months, okay. And then, unfortunately, we, uh, Bishop Camito was supposed to join us for this session. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it. I have a small statement, which I'll, I'll uh, read out at the end of our, of our discussion before we go into Q&A. And also, uh, we were supposed to have Jason Su from uh, Taiwan in the opposition in the Blue Party. Uh, he's a member of Parliament. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it because he's very busy uh, at the moment uh, getting uh, basic income into his own party's platform. So that's you know that's good news, but unfortunately, we don't get to talk to him today. today. Okay, let's uh, kick off with. Hello, 경기도에서 온 경기도 부지사 이화영입니다. 반갑습니다. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kwai Lee from 
Kyungi Province, South Korea, you know, Vice President uh, of Kyungi Do, the Republic of Korea. Thank you very much for inviting me at such a precious place and giving me an opportunity to deliver a keynote presentation at session A. I am extremely glad to see many people know who participated in the Republic of Korea. Uh, basic income acquisition and international conference held in Chongi province in the last five the content I am presenting today is related to Kyongi province youth basic income which introduced the concept of basic income for very first time in Republic of Korea. So we will have a PPT, yes they will uh, talk more. Do you know about the Youth Basic Income? The Gyeonggi-do Youth Basic Income, also known as the Youth Dividend, is a basic income policy created to protect the basic rights of the youths of Gyeonggi-do. Starting in April 2019, the Gyeonggi-do Youth Basic Income supports youths residing in Gyeonggi-do by providing up to 1 million Korean won a year in regional currency. The need for a youth basic income began with careful thought about basic income. The discussion about basic income first began in European countries with a recognition of the problem that the conventional welfare system wasn't enough to resolve the issues brought on by the ever-increasing income gap. In Korea, the number of youths unable to become economically independent has increased due to long-term job insecurity. As youths cut down on their spending, it eventually led to worse economic stagnation. To improve youth's quality of life and revive the local economy, Gyeonggi-do has implemented the first Youth Basic Income program in Korea. The program was launched in April 2019 and it became the most popular policy, with 124,438 youths signing up in just one quarter. While the Gyeonggi-do Youth Basic Income is already in effect, there is controversy about its effectiveness and benefits. However, there are those who have achieved clear benefits from such a policy. Since 1982, Alaska has been operating the Alaska Permanent Fund for its residents. By distributing the income from investing the funds acquired from natural resources, Alaska was able to significantly lower income inequality and improve the quality of life and happiness of its residents. The first prerequisite for continuously providing basic income is securing financial resources. That's why Gyeonggi-do has set its sights on a land value tax for basic income. A land value tax will not only secure the financial resources for the basic income, but also resolve the issue of real estate inequality. The Gyeonggi-do Youth Basic Income embraces hope for tomorrow and the determination for a happier life. Aren't you curious to find out more about this new change that Gyeonggi-do is leading? Discover our youth's dreams and happiness through the Gyeonggi-do Youth Basic Income in Gyeonggi-do, a province of global inspiration. Gyeonggi-do, as basic uh, content about the youth basic income of Gyeonggi province has been introduced in the PPT, I speak uh, uh, in brief. Uh, first, Gyeonggi province was uh, Gyeonggi province youth basic income was started from a uh, youth dividend policy, uh, which was promoted as one of the three free wealth projects in 2016, 
with governor Ijai Young served as Songnam city mayor. 역시 한국의 정치권에서는 무상급식을 계기로 선택적 복지와 보편적 복지 논쟁이 제기되어 왔고 보수 우파 진영에서는 청년 배당의 국회의 보수 도입 같은 보편적 복지 학교 움직에 대해서 헬리콥터 원이다 악마의 속상인가며 그래서 전방위적인 포퓰리즘 공세를 펼쳤습니다. 심지어 일하지도 않는 사람에게 무슨 기본소득이냐며 오히려 기본소득과 같은 복지 정책을 확대하면 So that time, because of free school meals, selected uh, welfare and universal welfare controversy was raised continually, and uh, radical right wing was against universal welfare expansion movement. So they termed this as youth dividend shift introduction of basic income, and they called it helicopter money and whispering of devil. And started populism attack from all directions. They strongly opposed it by saying, "What basic income for the people who don't even work, and rather citizens can be lazy with this sort of program." The Dutch government has been in the past very strong in the development of the economy, and the people who are not working are the ones who are suffering the most. The Dutch government is not a social organization, and it is not a social organization that helps the poor and the needy. 세금을 내는 주도자가 당당히 요구해야 할 권리입니다. 일부에서 복지학계는 좋은데 예산이 없다고 하지만 무조건 하지 않고 예산 예산 낭비하지 않으며 세금 털로 막고 세납 세금을 달고도 공공성을 확대하면 증세 없이도 충분히 가능할 수 있습니다. 결과적으로 정치인의 철학과 의식, 과감한 실천이 무엇보다 중요합니다. However, welfare, welfare expansion is the duty of government and local autonomous body that is there in the constitution and basic right which must be enjoyed appropriately by the citizens paying tax. Therefore, welfare is neither free nor is it one-sided benefit to the poor. It is the right that must be demanded only by taxpayers. Some say that welfare expansion is good, but there is no budget. However, If corruption is controlled and budget is not wasted in vain, tax evasion, evasion is stopped, tax barrier is collected well, and public publicity expansion is made, then it can be possible without increasing the tax. As a result, politicians' philosophy, will, and bold action is more important than anything else. 한국 사회에서 청년 세대는 가장 높은 실업률을 기록하고 있음에도 불구하고 생애 주기별로 주어진 책이 가장 취약한 계층입니다. 청년 기본 소득은 청년들이 미래와 꿈을 지원하기 위한 최소한의 성의로 노인 기초 연금이 후 배당이라면 청년 기본 소득은 선투자 개념입니다. 미래 세대의 청년 문제를 해결해야 할 세대 간 갈등 요인도 줄이고 사회 경제적 비용을 절감하는 등 기성 세대에게도 이득이고. 공동체 유지에도 도움이 됩니다. In Korean society, in spite of young generation facing highest unemployment rate, supported policy is the weakest. Youth basic income is a minimum commitment to support young people's future and dreams. If the basic old age pension is post dividend, youth basic income is the concept of free investment. If the problem of youth, who is the future generation, is solved. The generational conflict factor will decline, and it will help older generation reduce social economic cost, and it will also help maintain the communities. 저희도 우리도 청년 기본 소득 정책에 대해서 화면 통해 보시겠습니다. So I'll show about Gyeonggi Province youth basic income structure on screen. 어 여기도 청년 기본 소득 정책의 가장 큰 특징으로는 부분적 기본적 기본소득 정책의 한계를 가지고 있지만 단순한 실험이 아닌 정책의 구체적인 실행 과정에 있다는 것입니다. 또한 청년 기본소득을 경기도 각 시군에서만 사용할 수 있는 지역 화폐로 지급해 청년들의 복지 향상과 지역 경제 활성화 효과를 동시에 기대할 수 있습니다. 그렇게 세계적으로 15만 명을 대상으로 기본소득 정책 실행의 결과를 분석할 수 있는 모델로. 이번 소득 역사에서 큰 의미가 있는 사례로 세계적 관심을 모으고 있다고 생각합니다. The biggest specialty of Gyeonggi Province youth basic income policy is that it has the limitation of partial basic income policy, but 
It's not a simple experiment, but a concrete implementation process of the policy. Moreover, the youth basic income can be paid in local currency that can be used only in each city and county of Kyongi province, so that the welfare of the youth and the revitalization of local economy can simultaneously be expected, especially by analyzing the results of basic income policy implementation for 150,000 people worldwide as a model. It is attracting attention worldwide as a meaningful example in the history of basic income. Thank you. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here at this International Congress of the Basic Income Earth Network. I'd like to uh, compliment Barbara Jackers. Jacobson and uh, and say thank you very much for the night and I'd like to thank the Islam parties in the name of all members of the council that are gathering here in my chat in youth and adolescence I started to in Brazil, we have so much inequality, so much poverty. What we can do is think about the example of Galileo Galilei, Nicolau Copernicus. We need to say what they do, and what do they do about that. And after studying business administration, I decided to become a professor of economics. My master's degree in, in economics at Michigan State University, also a time studying at Stanford. There I happen to know about the concept of a negative minimum income, negative income tax, <coughs> such as acted by people like Milton Friedman, George Taylor, Jacob Bowman, and so many others. Then when I first was elected senator in 1990, in 1991, April, I decided to present the government to guarantee minimum income for negative income tax. And um, so this was approved by the summit, but the debate about it turned into a new proposition. Provide a guaranteed minimum income related to educational opportunities. And uh, in 1994, 1994, Sidney John the University of Sao Paulo of Rio de Janeiro and told me, Why don't you come to London for the Fifth International Congress of Young? That he and other friends started in 1986 in Lebanon, and then I went and I met there people like uh, Klaus Hoff and uh, so many of you that are here, Alexander de Rue, uh, Robert, <coughs> and others, and, and Philippe and others, and, and I became more and more interested in the concept of uh, unconditional basic income. In, and uh, <clears throat> so, local projects of banking and income related to education opportunities, so called the Bolsa Scholar, started in Brazil in local municipalities, Brasilia, Campinas, and so on. And new projects appeared in the Congress for the union to finance those municipalities that would start. Uh, guaranteed minimum income. Again, Philip Hoffman was in 1996. I took up to the president, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, to hit the goals. He said the objective is to have one day the unconditional basic income, but 
start a guaranteed minimum income relating to education opportunities will, will mean investment in human capital is a good start. So, Fernando Cardoso uh, was able to do the law through, through which uh, the federal government will finance the municipalities that will start programs in that direction. Mm. And so, uh, other similar programs started in Brazil, and when President Lula came to power in 2003, uh, he joined four different uh, income transfer programs into what became the most of the media program uh, to give a guaranteed minimum income to families as long as their children are going to school, as long as their children are being vaccinated, and other aspects. Of 3 million, 3.5 million families were enrolled in the most of the media program in December 2003. And today, about 14 million, 14 to 3 million Brazilian families, almost one fourth of our population of almost 210 million inhabitants, so about 50 million Brazilians are enrolled in the Bolsa of the Media program. More and more I became interacting with the young members and literature and economists and philosophers all over the world. I became uh, persuaded that even better would be the unconditional basic income. And then I presented a new project in December 2001 to, to start in Brazil by 2005 on, the unconditional universal basic income to all Brazilians, including foreigners living in Brazil for five years or more. And the uh, rapporteur, a, a one year senator, told me, Eduardo, it's a good idea, but you should have it. Uh, you should uh, Consider a paragraph that says that the basic income will be reduced gradually, step by step, taking the, uh, the priority first those most in need until one day we will have it for everyone. I consider this uh, a good sense of proposal. I accept it. And thanks to that, uh, the the project of law was approved by the Senate, by all parties, December 2002, December 2003, by all parties in the Chamber of Deputies. The present president, Jair Bolsonaro, was a federal deputy, didn't say anything against it. And in January 8, 2003, uh, President Lula after listening to his Minister of Finance, since it is to be introduced gradually, it is feasible, so you may, you may sanction. And then I, there was a beautiful ceremony in the palace of Do Planalto, and President Lula, in the presence of Philippe von Paris, signed. I'm, I would like to show here uh, my sister. <laughs> I would like to stand away. <laughs> so I, I need to conclude uh, my first talk with uh, what. Monica Dallari that helped me in writing my speech. Uh, but in, in my lecture here, I described what Monica and I saw in Kenya last January. We came there very enthusiastic about the basic income experience that it directly is, has initiated. And I would like to I, I will ask uh, 
everybody will receive my my copy of my uh, <laughs> so now right now I only want to say Loma Libri, Thank you very much. Good morning, friends of basic income. Good morning. From my dear to reality, from utopia to necessity, I will talk about time, public support, political support and political steps, mainly in Holland and Western Europe. I'm 45 years in politics now. I was city councillor in Amsterdam, and I was a member of the European Parliament. I was founder of the Dutch Green Party, I was there at the beginning, the beginning, and I was treasurer the first 18 years. I think now the time has come for basic income. But first, we go back a little bit in time. The Dutch welfare state. The idea was sought out in 1944, and it was realized in 1974. So it took 30 years to build the Dutch welfare state. And of course, as you all know, the last 40 years it has been unraveling. Realizing a basic income in countries like Holland, Belgium, or Finland does not take 30 years. And the reason is the money is basically already there. The full basic income scheme in Holland only costs 15 billion euros, 2% of our gross national product of over 800 million. It's only 2%. We need to swing, and a small carbon tax is enough to finance that. Public support. In 1994, 25 years ago, we had a fierce debate about basic income in Holland. It was even discussed at cabinet level. The right-wing liberals and the left-wing liberals were in favor, and the social democrats were against. They said it's too expensive. At that time, only 20% the Dutch public supported the basic income. Five years ago, it was 30%. Three years ago, it was 40 And last year, it was 50 And I think today, it will be 60%, just like it is nowadays already in Belgium. Why this increase of support, public support? I think there are three reasons. The Great Economic Recession, 2008-2016. People in the middle class had to sell their houses because they became unemployed and their houses were standing under water. So they ended up as a debt. And everybody knows somebody that happens to that. So the belief in the neoliberal solutions are gone. One of the most important reasons is that today 50% of Holland has a regular well paid job. The other 50% doesn't. They have a flat job. They're a one person job. They have no job or they're in several kinds of benefit systems. For them, the present system built by the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats the last 50 years makes no sense. And the last 10 years, basically, the Social Democrats introduced four measures which made Social Security and income tax related to your income. And the result is that 60% of Holland, the lowest 60% is stuck. Their real taxes are 70, 80, 90, 100, and even over 100%, which means your gross rates go up and your net income goes down. And the government proved, promised to remove that absurdity, but they haven't done yet. And of course, for the top 40%, they pay 50% taxes and they try about it. Raising public support. The Swiss referendum was very important, and the 16 experiments worldwide, especially the Finnish and the Canadian, helped the discussion in Holland. And now it's Yang in the US, which also in Holland gets a lot of attention. Before it was Hamon, the French presidential campaign. The president in France which took the discussion forward in France. And in Germany, you have both this. Um, Einkommen, which is a political party, which raises the attention there. And you have Mein Gut Einkommen, which is a lottery for people. So you get the basic income yourself. So more than 250 people have experienced it now, and journalists are writing about it. 
The most important thing in Europe we will do next year is to have a European-wide signature campaign for basic income. And we need one million signatures. And there are 20 organizations like mine in the Netherlands and the other 19 countries which are already to start out of the 28 countries in the European Union. And I think this time we will succeed. If only because this time a technical, technical signature is enough. Six years ago, we need a physical signature. Public support. Translating into political support is a different issue. We have to show that basic income is affordable because the Dutch reinvented capitalism 400 years ago. Everything is financed also in the minds of the people. So we have to show basic, basic income is affordable. And we make a proposal, basic income 2.0, 600 euros for every individual and 600 euros for every household. So if you're alone, you have 1,200 euros, which is the present minimum for the lowest. And if you're together, you have 1,800 euros, which is more than the present minimum. And child benefit raising from 100 to 300 euros. And that costs only 2% of gross national income. The result, people at the bottom get 22 and even 300 euros more than they have now. People in the middle even get a small plus, and now you get less 20% the top they have to pay. That was very well received in the Dutch media. The basic income seems possible after all. That was how they wrote about it. Now I come to the most difficult step, political steps. And I advocate, like before, step by step. You could start giving it by group. Like Belgium, the uh, Green Party has proposed that all the youngsters in Belgium will get a basic income from 18 to 25. Or you can go the same way as they propose in Korea. Youngsters, farmers, small businessmen. In Germany, the Greens are proposing a different proposal. You have hard score. People who are a long time unemployed. It's very low and they don't get out. So the Greeks have proposed to make a different system so that people can earn on top and get out of their misery. And it will cost 30 billion euros, similar to what we propose in Holland. We will propose for the next election, 2021, by the Greeks and hopefully also by the Liberal Democrats and the Social Democrats, a half basic income. 600 euros for every adult and build your pensioner because then you get more. Because we have already a basic pension, a basic income for the pensioners already since 1957, a long time. And we will raise child benefits to 300 euros. We're working together, the activists and the group, Greens, Liberal Democrats, and Social Democrats, together we represent about one third to 40 percent of the electorate. And we hope to realize that in the national government program in 2021, a better world is possible with a basic income for everyone, everywhere. Thank you. Morning, everyone. I'm an, my name is Karen Yosa. I'm from South Africa. My interest in basic income really started six years ago. We just emerged from the 2014 elections and we were sitting in Parliament uh, at a caucus meeting and the leader of our party, the Democratic Alliance, asked the question, why is it that our party is perceived as not caring about the poor when we consistently proclaim the opposite and we have a track record in the places where we govern that this is not true? So this question really intrigued me, and I came to the conclusion that the answer lies not so much in what we were saying, but what we were not saying. And what we were not saying much about is the extensive grant system in South Africa. So every month, 17 million poor South Africans receive a non-contributory cash transfer, means the cash transfer from the state. The system originates from uh, Britain in the 1920s when old age pensions were given to so called white and colored people, and then it was expanded to include disability grants and poor 
others, the children also got it wrong. So when the ANC took over in 1994, all the race, racial discrimination in terms of benefits were eliminated, but the overall design of the system stayed intact. So um, initially, I thought I'm only going to focus on the disability grant and the old age grant, but I very soon came to realize that I can't ignore the child grant because it constitutes 70% of all grants. That's, and I was pregnant at the time, so I found it very fascinating to read about the nutritional, uh, about the original intention of the grant, which was to support the nutritional needs of children in the first thousand days. So very disturbingly, the impact of the child grant in, in the last couple of years has been reduced, and the reason for that is twofold. Firstly, the financial value of the child grant is no longer linked to an objective measure of what it actually costs to feed a child. And secondly, because of the widespread unemployment, the child grant, just like any other income, is spread across the household. And it is really the second point, coming to grips with the pervasiveness of unemployment, but also income deprivation, that really they uh, sparked my interest in basic income and eventually reframing the concept to fit the current South African context. Have I been successful? Uh, the answer is yes and no. I have managed to get the idea of setting a basic income floor at the food poverty line, which is $37, into our manifesto, 2019 manifesto, as well as increasing the child grant to this level. But that said, our election focused more on jobs, uh, secure borders, and ending corruption. For better or for worse, we had a disappointing election, um, but this has necessitated a review of our policy offer, and I'm very excited to say that the leader of our party, Mr. Simai Mane, is on his way to India, and he will be speaking to some of the delegates here, as well as visit the pilot areas to speak to the beneficiaries to see if a similar policy can work in South Africa. So the model that I developed is called the empowerment model. Um, I think, let me start by, I think it is important to understand the current South African context. Uh, we currently have 10 million unemployed people. Now that is more unemployed if you look at the expanded definition. That's more unemployed people than the USA and Germany combined. It is more unemployed people than in India, and it's more unemployed people than in China. So. The unemployment is, uh, yeah, it's long term and it's become a sort of a fixed condition. And then added to that, the median wage for Black South Africans is two hundred dollars per person uh, for the month. So if you divide that between a family of four, it's hardly enough for for everyone to survive. So what the empowerment model does, it sets the basic income floor at the food poverty line, which is thirty-seven dollars per person per month. And it then follows a two-phase approach. In the first phase, the child grant is increased to that level, and then in the second phase, an empowerment grant is phased into working age adults with an income below either the upper down poverty line or the lower down poverty line. If you target first the adults uh, below the food poverty line, it's going to cost three billion dollars. Now that's not a lot of money, but it is a lot of money if you don't have it. Because in South Africa, unfortunately, we can't go the VAT route and we can't go the income tax route. But there's one place where we can get the money, and that is by changing the way the Black Economic Empowerment Scorecard works. Now, I don't want to go into much detail, but this scorecard emanates from a very comprehensive social economic policy called Black Economic Empowerment. And if impacts all facets of the South African economy, uh, uh, social economy, social economy, yes. So it started in the oil and gas industries and then moved on to mining, fishery, agriculture, finance, and banking, and so on. And although they are, the charges differ, at its core, it requires business to spend a percentage of their net after tax profit on black economic empowerment. So the government then specifies specifically how this should be done. There are specific requirements for ownership, specific requirements for management and control, specific requirements for uh, skills development, specific requirements for procurement, and specific requirements for, for charity. So 
Very important example in terms of management from and control, it says 85% of junior management must be black people. 6% of the wage bill must go to uh, reskilling black employees. 1% of net after tax profit must go to charities that uh, empower black, that has black beneficiaries. So, what I then argued is that this particular model set forth by the government is not a socially just model in the sense that it doesn't protect the rights of the most insecure. You can think of yourself in the rural areas where there is no business, they don't benefit from anything from this. Um, it also puts controls on some people that it doesn't put on others. It's not really about decent work uh, and it's not a rights based approach. So the proposal is for business to take so 10% of their net after tax profit and put that into a fund, and that fund then distributes the empowerment grant. So it's using existing money from business just in a more efficient, socially just, and effective way. Now, as I said, at the moment, basic income is not a, it's not a political priority. Uh, the priorities of the day is corruption, jobs, land distribution, national health insurance. But hopefully that will change with Lucy's visit here. Oh, I have to get to the important. I have to get to the important thing. Obviously, twenty years ago, uh, basic income was a hot topic in South Africa. But clearly, it didn't have sufficient buy-in from the right politicians. And I think it is incredibly important to do one change to understand the political process because it's not enough to write it out and understand basic income, you need to understand politics and you need to play the game. There are three things that are very important. You need to understand how MPs are elected. So in South Africa, it's a list system. The internal list process is very seldom about uh, policy and expertise. It's about power and influence. So the thing you need to take home is don't expect that the MP you encounter actually cares or is an expert in their field. The second thing that is important, you have to understand the organizational culture from which that MP is a representative. Because ultimately in South Africa, MP are accountable to their political party. And you might like, get a nice MP that is uh, competent and that cares about the work, but if the organizational culture is not right, it won't go much further. Um, and then lastly, I think it is very important to understand the power dynamics within political parties. All politicians will make you think that they are important, but that all of them are not equal. It is very often that your social development politicians are subservient to your more economic and finance MPs, and at the same time, political leadership has considerable uh, influence about what MPs can support and what they cannot support. I think to take uh, to summarize, there's four things that are really important. First, you need to package the idea in a local form that is politically viable, that's financially viable, and that you can sell to the electorate. Um, you have to do your political homework. You have to know who is who, and then lastly, you shouldn't be out and you both you have to build strategic alliances around understanding where you fit in in the proverbial food chain. Hi everybody, good morning. Thank you for making it out so early today. I just wanted to thank DM for having me and Sarah for inviting me. My name is Larry Cohen and I wanted to share a little bit about my journey here to getting here on stage. My journey with basic income starts in college. And it's not because in college I was taught basic income, actually far from it. I didn't hear about basic income until much later. But in college I was really interested in nonprofits and helping people in business and thinking that business is a self-sustainable way to, to run a for-profit organization. Both of those ideas, they seemed in contrast to each other, but they both interested me. So when I graduated in 2008, the beginning of the United, the recession for, for basically the world, and I couldn't get a job at an ice cream store. I couldn't get a job that I had worked for three years, uh, worked at an ice cream store in college, and I couldn't even get a job after that. I really looked and thought, wow, Things are different. The, the job market is different. The ability for people to find work is changing. What are we going to do? I had the fortunate opportunity to learn about a company that combined my interests in both the nonprofit world and business. 
a company called Tom's Shoes. And Tom's Shoes was a little bit different. With Tom's, it was a shoe company, and with every pair of shoes that was purchased, a pair of shoes was given to a child in need. And I thought, wow, that's such an interesting combination of both helping people in a sustainable business. That's, that's where I have to go. So on very short notice, I convinced them to take me on as an intern, and I lived with 14 other people in a house, uh, the group of us as interns, working for this small shoe company that just had a different kind of idea of how to do business. And I thought, this is the future. This is the future of business. This is what we should be pushing for. This will create the change that we need to help improve people's lives. I was fortunate enough to work at Tom's for just about eight years. And in those eight years, I was able to go on giving trips where I went to different developing countries. And I got to give shoes on children who needed them very badly. I was able to see adults get eye surgeries uh, that would help cure their cataract surgery and deal with many of the other issues and health problems that were challenging these, these bright and wonderful people in these developing countries. But while I was there, I realized uh, a new thought. It was just a drop in the bucket. Tom's became, over those eight years, a worldwide known, pretty famous company with hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. And yet I would go to these countries and I would see just how many people were suffering. And I thought, this is helpful, but it's not enough. It's a drop in the bucket. How are we going to do some systemic change? How are we going to change the system to be able to tackle the challenges of today? In 2014, I was just browsing the internet like many of you, and I came across this fascinating article on media by an interesting guy I'd never heard of. His name was Scott Santos. And Scott wrote about this really interesting idea that when I first read it, I was blown away. This concept of basic income, this long history of advocates and believers just providing basic income, providing a floor of income for everybody, unconditionally, individually, and how that was demonstrated to show tremendous social change. And yet this idea never came to fruition, even though just a few years before, in the 60s and 70s, it had almost happened in the United States, and then everyone forgot about it. That was the lightning bolt when I realized I needed to start into the basic income movement and become part of this movement. After I finished my work at Tom's, I dedicated myself to advocating for UBI. And in the past few years, I've had the pleasure of meeting some of you in this audience, reading many of your works, and really trying to absorb as much as I could about the, the vast history about UBI and why we need it now more than ever. Most recently, I was at a UBI conference in 2017, and among talking with many other attendees, there was this really interesting entrepreneur. And this entrepreneur had started for-profit companies that had created jobs, a non-profit company that helped create jobs across the United States. But he too saw that it was a drop in the bucket with the amount of jobs being lost. And, more, and just as important, the amount of jobs and the insecurity that people were feeling across the United States and across the world. So when I wrote to this entrepreneur after the conference, I said, we should team up, we should do something together. Like, we, we feel that we're on the same path, that poverty and all these other issues, the moral case for, for basic income, the, the scientific case for basic income, but now the technological case, the necessity case for basic income. We need to, we need to do something about that. And he said, I agree. Just, just as a heads up, uh, I'm, I'm running for president. And I said, oh, well, that's one way to, to change the conversation. And so that was the time that I got to meet Andrew Yang and help start volunteering with his campaign in 2017. And for a while, it was just small events and him introducing the concept to people. And it was, it was really fun because it was grassroots. It was, it was taking the idea to the people. And slowly but surely, people were listening to what he had to say about automation, about technological changes, about the disruption to the very kinds of lives that we've lived for hundreds of years. And that why this time was different. So when I got to work with Andrew on a Los Angeles rally in 2019, this is after he had done a couple of interviews where he started to gain some incredible momentum. That was another moment where I thought, man, 
we need to have another way to support Andrew to really boost his reach and, and get more and more people to learn about Andrew. What can I do for that? So a few Yang gangers, so a few supporters of Andrew Yang and I decided we were going to do something that had been usually perceived as only for the political elite, something that was reserved only for rich people and for big corporations, and that was to start a super PAC. I won't go into all the details about a super PAC because they're long and cumbersome, but basically we were using the tools that big corporations and big money had used for not so great purposes, and we were going to use it at the grassroots, at the grassroots level. So now, my co-founders and I have started the Humanity Forward Fund, which brings together supporters for basic income and raises money to advocate for both the policies of basic income and the candidates who support it, supporting Andrew Yang, the president, as well as other candidates who are coming out and speaking out as to why basic income is important now more than ever. When I first started my journey with basic income, I told myself, in 10 years, by 2024, basic income would be a reality. Hopefully because we were able to make it happen on our terms, but potentially because we needed, so, it, we needed it so badly that it needed to happen regardless. With Andrew's success in the United States and his popularity, and with the growth in all these other countries of the idea, I still believe very firmly that basic income is not something we're looking for toward the future, that's something we can do right now. And with your help, we can achieve it. Thank you. That one question is, some of your presentations have kind of dealt with this, but what is the, the major obstacle, what's the major political obstacle you find um, against, against the sort of promotion of basic income or or the political implementation, implementation of basic income. Okay, so if we just kind of go down the line from. Mushangro,Sarabrege,Bokchi,Hetel,Jungle,Manbunje,Sasida,Pelia,Hamsa,Sasipo,Jogi,Jungle,Jungle,Jungle,Jungle,Jungle,Jungle,Jungle,Jung
But people who are not in those industries, even though they, the, the five that he talks about basically take up 50% of all jobs in America, but people who aren't in those jobs think, oh, it, people will be fine, you know, they'll, they'll adjust, it's not a big deal. But when he's been able to talk to those who are in these industries, those people really connect with him. And those are people on both sides of the political aisle, which is why you're seeing former Bernie supporters and former Trump supporters openly share that and explain why Andrew is a candidate who's speaking to them differently in a way that means something and coming up with solutions like the basic income, like the freedom dividend, that would make a tangible change to their life and allow them to move forward in building the life they'd like to lead. Perfect. So what is the major obstacle at the moment for the implementation of basic income? Well, of course, uh, it's not so cheap. Uh, it will cost a lot. If we take into account what the most of the media costs today about $32 billion, uh, $32 billion reais per, per year, if we were to pay something more to all 209 million Brazilians today, say 100 reais per month to 1,200, this will cost about uh, 100 and, about 252 billion is quite a lot, but well, uh, March 2017, President Dilma Rousseff, already away from the government, was asked by journalists, have you done any mistake in your government? Yes. <clears throat> I thought that by providing uh, fiscal subsidies to entrepreneurs, they would invest more and this would be good for employment, jobs, and so on. However, they absorbed the, those subsidies in the form of profits. So I went to see how much uh, tax subsidies were paid, were, were given to those who are better off, the entrepreneurs. In 2018, this was 292 billion reais, much more than what we would, if we were to pay about $25 per capita to all Brazilians per month. So it is feasible, but we need to <coughs> persuade the people, everyone. Okay. Oh, no, that was not so tight. Great, thank you. Karen? Yeah. What's the political, like, what I'm trying to get at really are the kind of the, the political obstacles that you face? Um, well, it's not such an easy, it's not such an easy question. I think the thing that is most important, we actually had a discussion on the bus, the wording and how you frame it is incredibly important. Um, I, for example, don't even think we should use the word basic income in South Africa. It comes with way too much baggage. It's immediately assumed you're going to get paid to everyone, and it's political suicide if you're going to pay money to the rich. People won't listen to you. And then, um, yeah, so your wording is incredibly important, and people just assume it's, it's unaffordable if you talk basic income. So wording is very, very, very important. And then, as I mentioned in my, in my speech, then you need to start building strategic alliances by understanding who is who in politics and really getting to grips with the organizational culture, the political parties that the MPs represent. The party is bigger than the individual MPs. They come and go. So you need to get a, a space in a, a particular political party. And um, you have to build your strategic alliances. And then I think in South Africa, you know, some countries might have lots of time available to them. In South Africa, I don't think we have lots of time left over uh, because there's, our unemployment is so big, there is simply no jobs. There's so many people that are really angry and frustrated because they can't get work. I think, you know, South Africa might have our sort of Arab Spring in the next three years if something drastic does not change. You see it in our in your our crime statistics, this anger and resentment. I mean, we have like 59 people being murdered every day. We have more than 100 rapes every day. Um, so we're sort of in a kind of a civil war with ourselves. And what you need to understand about that is 
a war necessitates generals, and generals don't do democracy. And in a war, people are not really interested in politics. So we really have to get the wording right, get the right politicians, and move for speed in South Africa. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, my former teacher, yeah. Robert John Pompertain, he says it's still moral, moral issues in Holland. Philip thinks so too. But I think it's not moral issues which is a problem in Holland in discussion. It's only the people who vote for Christian parties, which is less than 20% nowadays, who say you have to work and sweat it and earn your money, and then only maybe then you can get some money from the state. That's 20%. Then you have the middle class who vote for the right and liberals. They're afraid that they will have to give some money for that basic income. That's their real fear. That's also what you see in countries like Finland, if you really go through the interpretation well. But basically, it's political pressure. Uh, Guy Standing, I don't know if he's here, but he was allowed to give a lecture, the uh, Bilderberg Conference lecture, and in front of him was Angelica Merkel and Mark Rutte, the Prime Minister of my country, and he spoke 45 minutes about the experiment here in India, and they were forced to listen 45 minutes. <laughs> and after those 45 minutes, Angelica Merkel kept sitting, but Mark Rutte bought the book from Guy Standing, and he read it actually. And in the last government formation, my party said, we should have basic income and we should have experiments. And they agreed on a compromise formula that all the communes are allowed to experiment with basic income. And it was signed by Mark Rutte, and it was signed by the Christian Democrat leader. It's just political pressure. That's what you need. So my hope is if you have get these three parties, Green, Social Democrats, and Left Wing Liberals, to go for this half basic income, we will have enough power. Why don't we go for a full basic income? Because while we were discussing this, the Minister from the Social Affairs, Liberal Government, yeah, okay, it might be financial, but I'm afraid that too many people will stop working. And if you have 600 euros, you cannot live on 600 euros. You can live from 1200, but not from 600. So if you have 600 plus 600 as a partner, then you need only one partner to work. So changes will already start, but it will not be a complete disruption of the labor market. So that's why I think this proposal is politically more interesting and maybe acceptable also for the right wing party. Thank you very much. Okay, so right before going to questions from the floor, I'm just going to read a little bit from uh, a statement that we've had from Archbishop Kamita. He unfortunately couldn't get here from Namibia. Um, I think almost every Congress for the last uh, five years has tried to tried to uh, get his attendance, and it's been very difficult. Uh, first of all, he sends his greetings to the Congress. And he would like to uh, extend, I would like, allow me to extend, at the onset, to extend my utmost gratitude to the organizers uh, for having invited me to this important Congress. At the same time, I extend my warmest congratulations to the Indian Network for Based Income for the successful hosting of the 19th World Based Income Congress. So, Namibia has made significant progress in the reduction of poverty since attaining independence on 21st March 1990 about 29 years ago. Although this progress can be attributed to many factors, such as healthy economic growth and others, the introduction of targeted social safety nets, including universal pension and social grants for people with disabilities, as well as for orphans and vulnerable children, have played a significant role in reducing poverty levels in Namibia. Therefore, when His Excellency Dr. Hage G. Uh, Geinbog uh, came to power, sorry if I mispronounced that, uh, came to power in the year 2015 as the third democratically elected president of the Republic of Namibia, he increased the pension and disability grants by 67, 66.7% initially and to reach 100% in increment by 2017. And then there's more about that. Uh, we'll publish this statement uh, later on on the website or someplace. Um, right, I'm just going to get on to... So, right, so the... 
So basically, um, Bishop Kamita tried to introduce a basic income uh, when he was when, when he was selected to be uh, Minister for Poverty Eradication by the present government. Um, but although the Harmony Prosperity Plan, which was targeted, which was a targeted plan to accelerate it develop, to accelerate development. The Ministry of Poverty Eradication and Social Welfare was tasked under the Social Progression Pillar to investigate the feasibility of consolidating, expanding, and strengthening the country's social welfare nets. So they tried, they, they looked at it, um, so they proposed basic income to mainly target the poor and vulnerable who are excluded from current social protection systems. Um, and what they managed to get they didn't quite manage to get the basic income, um, although they argued for it very strongly. Uh, but they, but he says that there are growing sentiments across our nation that giving people money for free will make them lazy and dependent. But I believe, this is Mr. Pinita believes, that investing in people is liberating and empowering. Let us therefore give our people an opportunity to be part of the development agenda by providing them with a basic income that will help them to rise from the mud of poverty and realize social justice. As I conclude, I would like to acknowledge and appreciate the dedication of our government towards the maintenance of the well-being of the Namibian people and as enshrined in the supreme law of the country, the Constitution. I further want to urge all of us to remain committed and to be passionate in advancing a social development agenda which is not charity, but promote social justice and human rights and the integrity of human beings. This is now the hour for the world to make a decision which will change the appalling situation in which billions across the globe are finding themselves in the midst of a sea of wealth for a long-lasting justice, peace, and prosperity on our planet. I wish and pray for the great success of this Congress, and I thank you. That's Bishop Kamita from Namibia. Okay, great. Now, we have um, about 20, 20 minutes for questions, yes? Okay, so somebody needs to be down, down on the floor with one of the mics so we can hear it. My name is Professor Iswara Kodiaka from India. I want to... Uh, attempt to delve into and uh, answering what uh, Madame Gwab uh, uh, has asked and also to provide uh, a solution. Mm -hmm. I, the problem is that the, I basically come as face, I think, are twofold. The first is that we, those who believe in basic income, have not given it out there. The market. We still own it. It is still an academic thing being discussed and handled by academicians in fora like this. The moment we hand it over to the politicians, the moment we hand it over there, then we shall have a breakthrough. The second uh, 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 thing I wish to say is a modification of what Madam Karen, Honorable Karen, was brought. We cannot wait for the politicians to fall what they do not believe in. We, the believers in basic income, must ourselves struggle to actually occupy political offices. Something you realize when Eduardo Suplicy was a senator, he was able to bring it in and there was an attempt to implement basic income. So we cannot expect those who do not believe in basic income to actually run with our agenda. I do therefore propose to this Congress today that one of the solutions we should make is to have the clandestinity of the true believers. And one of the things we must do is to make this basic income movement also a political movement across the world. And to do so, I therefore propose we adopt Solalinsky's model of uh, the 12 rules for radical, and that is also how we are going to help the young, the young guns, the Alexander guns, 
They dwell of guns, the Kodiaka guns, and all the guns around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, there's a gentleman from Sikkim, I think. And then we'll start, and then Philip, and then Guy, and then we'll move on. Uh, yeah. My name is PD, right? Sorry, yeah. Thank you. PD, right. Uh, so, first of all, I completely agree with uh, the professor saying that uh, if you are in politics, like I am, then you can run with this uh, if you believe in the university basic income. So, that's to support the cause. Whether this institution will become uh, politically active is another matter. My question really is to Karen, and uh, this is uh, because I found it very interesting that uh, you are thinking of utilizing some kind of corporate social responsibility, uh, which we call corporate social responsibility in India. It's legislated under the Companies Act that 2% of profits of companies which are above a certain level of revenue uh, would be utilized under socially beneficial schemes. Those schemes are also uh, have been defined. But, as with going, look at, and you described your uh, South African uh, situation in terms of uh, the unemployment situation, in terms of uh, corruption and, and so on and so forth. So I would imagine that this particular space is already occupied in a, in more a political economy context. It would be very useful to learn from you how you would like to deal with this because it would be entrenched. Okay, so this is something which uh, didn't quite, I didn't quite think it's a practical solution. So maybe I'm wrong, maybe uh, you could. Uh, the second, uh, not a question, but to, uh, I think it's Larry, or uh, extremely uh, important are young people who would actually run with the ball. And, you would, uh, you know, I would imagine that there needs to be many more such like Larry Cohen's of the world if this really needs to move. Because all, uh, even in my uh, state, it's the young people who are going to be moving with this particular idea. And then by 2024, I would imagine that we would have uh, universal basic income in Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, if you don't mind waiting, I'd like the lady from uh, Sri Lanka to, to say something first. Thanks. Um, I'm Selvi Sanchitanandam from Basin. Can you speak into the microphone a little bit? I'm Basin King from Sri Lanka. Uh, my question is to Korea about very happy to see the youth dividend, but I also see this is a, a, a matter of periphery to the center. So, what is the support for? Attitude of the center to what's happening in your province. Okay, can we take any responses? Karen, do you want to respond to this? a couple of things? Um, I'm not entirely sure so that I understood the question correctly, but just to recap, it is a it is a corporate tax, um, social business social responsibility, and it is currently legislated. So what we would do is we have to change the legislation in order to use that money in a different way to sort of pay a basic income. So it's not a, that's getting back to the, the wording, it's not a new tax. It is an existing, it's existing money that we just use it a different way. Now I think business will be in favor of the new model because it's very simple, it's very transparent, there's no space for corruption in it. But the governing party is definitely not going to be in favor of this new model because the current model, because it's so complicated, because it has all these requirements of preferential procurement from certain people, uh, because it's based on skin color, you never stop being a certain skill co skin color, so you get the same people over and over getting contracts again. So this current model is really the mechanism, the tool that is used to facilitate corruption. And I don't think the current political elite will want to do away with that system because it generates billions and billions and billions of money. 
어, 첫 번째 회자에서 질문하신 분의 의견에 에, 동의합니다. 어, 우리나라 특히 경기도가 지금 말씀하신 분의 사례에 굉장히 그, 잘 좋은 사례에서 소개를 좀 해드릴까 합니다. 우리나라에서 경기도에서는 저기 계신 그, 저 우리 공부하시는 강남은 박사님이 어, 기본소득 네트워크를 만드셔가지고 그 생각을 어, 그러니까 교수가 어, 뿌리니까 그것을 경기도지사를 하는 이재명 지사가 그걸 받아들여서 그것을 정책화해서 그것이 지금 실현되는 그런 아주 좋은 사례가 어, 우리 한국에 있어, 있었습니다. 여기까지 들어주 So the, the first question uh, was there. I would like to agree with the question, and the same example is there in uh, South Korea, Gyeonggi-do province. Academicians and all the scholars are also participating in this awareness program, basic income awareness program. And here we have Dr. Hang Namun, uh, who is actively working in this field in South Korea to uh, aware, make the people aware of this program. 그래서 어, 이 기본소득이 어떻게 정책이 되고 어, 실행이 될 것인가 는 아까 말씀하신 것과 같이 선거가 굉장히 중요하다고 생각하는데 한국에서는 세 개의 큰 선거가 있습니다. 하나는 지방자치에 관한 선거고 두 번째는 국회의원 선거고 세 번째는 대통령의 선거입니다. 그런데 이 선거 중에 지금 기초단체가 시작하는 이재명 성남시장이 기본소득을 처음으로 실시하고 두 번째, 더큰 경기도 인구가 1350만 명이나 되는 경기도 선거에서 승리해서 다시 더 좋은 소득을 확산시켰고 다시 이재명 도지사가 한국의 강력한, 아주 강력한 대통령 후보이기 때문에 이재명 지사가 어, 대통령 선거 공약에 이 좋은 소득을 걸면 아마 여러분들이 깜짝 놀랄 만한 결과가 한국에서도 실현되지 않을까 다시 말씀드리면 아까 저분이 말씀하셨던 것처럼 어, 우리들의 생각과 정치적 정치인들의 에, 참여 그것이 투표 선거를 통해서 실현되는 그런 모델을 한국에서 어, 보실 수 있기 때문에 주목해 보시는 게 좋을 것 같습니다. So as you can see this example in South Korea, uh, first of all, uh, Governor Lee Jae Myung, uh, who is the current governor of uh, the province. Uh, he was he was just uh, city mayor, and at that time when he was at the city mayor, he introduced this program. He launched this uh, basic uh, income program, and he got a lot of support from there. And this was the reason he again extended this program, and uh, he was supported by many, and he became the governor. And you'll be surprised to know that if this campaign is uh, going on, then he may be the president of South Korea. So you can. Uh, employ this uh, and you can expand this worldwide. Thank you. Any other contributions to the floor? Uh, Philippe, and then Guy, and then the lady who's sitting next to Guy. I'd like to know whether any of the office, uh, any of the panelists, has strong views about uh, either of the following two questions. When you are campaigning for a modest basic income, a partial basic income, uh, basic income for youth, etc., it, does it help to campaign or does it damage your campaign to also to say that your ultimate objective is a generous basic income, unconditional for everyone? Hmm? This utopia of a generous basic income for everyone, does it help to campaign saying that, that that's your objective or does it damage you? The second question is, When you are campaigning for uh, your immediate or more remote objectives, does it help your campaign or does it damage your campaign to invoke, as uh, the Korean uh, participants did, does it help to invoke uh, people who are strongly associated with neoliberalism, like Milton Friedman, James Buchanan, or people who are strongly associated with wealth, like Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk? Uh, mentioning them, mentioning that they are supporters of this income, does it help your campaign or does it damage your campaign? Thank you. Uh, can you take the mic to up to Guy Standing, please? I, I feel most that you have uh, a lot of questions of Philippe's to answer. But I, I have a, 
an important story that, that I think all of you from developing countries uh, must take account of. And I'm addressing my remarks to Karen. Karen, I happen to be working for Nelson Mandela in 1995-96, and I addressed the cabinet in favor of basic income with Tabo Mbeki in the chair, and half the cabinet were in favor of moving towards a basic income, including the Minister of Social Welfare. And they set up a comprehensive commission, cross-party, that Desmond Tutu coming out to support an iconic figure in South Africa. We had a 10,000 people march on Parliament in Cape in favor of big basic income grant. Why did we lose? We lost for one very, very important reason. The IMF and the Minister of Finance combined to oppose it. And the IMF said to the government, you cannot go in that direction. Exactly the same thing happened in Namibia. When we were lobbying and working, and working with Bishop Smeeter, it wasn't the lack of ability of Smeeter, it was the fact that the IMF opposed. And I believe that is the single biggest obstacle to be overcome in any African country that wants to move in this direction. And I'd like to hear what your reaction to that would be. Great, thank you. And then uh, if you could pass the mic to the lady. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just say what's your name? Uh, Diana Bashir, I'm uh, working on UBI uh, in post conflicts. Um, just a quick question, Alexander, you mentioned what uh, the Dutch Prime Minister uh, did after uh, uh, the presentation by Dan Stanley. Uh, I'd just like to know what uh, Angela Merkel said, or whether she asked any questions. Sorry, that was really unclear, or if you could just... Yeah, what was the actual question? So what did Angela, Angela Merkel say after uh, listening to Dan Stanley, and did she ask any questions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Karen, do you want to? Yes, I'll, I'll start with Philippe's question. Yes, it definitely hurts us. So, uh, you know, I don't even want to use use the word basic income. Even if you would say, yeah, okay, we have an empowerment grant, and the goal is universal basic income in the end, it, 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 it won't work because business. This person they're going to think, oh, it's unaffordable. This person doesn't know what she's talking about. She doesn't understand economics. They don't, they won't, it won't. It's an emotional response. The facts and the figures don't matter. And then your second problem is going to come with giving money to the rich. Even if you, if it's going to come through tax back, it doesn't matter. People won't listen beyond the emotional response. And the emotional response is, oh, you're giving money to the rich. See, you want to increase inequality. You're, you're a party representing white minority capital. So it definitely hurts us, and we can't use those words. We need to frame it as something new, something different, something that fits the current South African context. And then to get back to Guy's uh, question or statement, you know, I, I'm sure that there, there was a lot of movement. It was before my time. But I, I do think it didn't have sufficient buy-in from what I call the right politicians. And I think it is important to not get caught up in individual politicians vilifying and glorifying certain individuals. It really in South Africa is about the party and the organizational culture and the internal values and behaviors. And the ANC that we have today is a very conservative patriarchal organization and it consists of a network of patronage. I think the last book that you wrote, uh, The Corruption of Capitalism, you can use South Africa. When I was reading the book, I was thinking, oh, this is the theory of South Africa. Um, you know, because it's all these, it's not, the politics is commodified. Uh, the politicians are commodities. Right now, at the moment, there's a big scandal going on because the president apparently did not know who funded his internal campaign when they were compiling the internal list. Uh, but he lied about it. He didn't know about it. You know, and, and it comes all the questions. I mean, what are, what are the 
uh, some of these people that got money became ministers and so on and so on. It's a long, long story. So I can't really talk about the IMF, but I do think I do think if you get to the right politicians and you have a strong organizational culture and the right people that you know maybe you could put up some resistance to the IMF. 그 아까 질문하고 제대로 답변을 좀 드리고 싶은데요. 선거 캠페인을 할때 어, 기본소득을 공약으로 하면 데미지를 받지 않는 것이다 그런 거에 대한 답변인데요. 어, 우리나라에서 특히 지금 저희가 일하고 있는 경기도에서 한 정책이 매우 흥미로운 정책이 있어서 같이 좀 소개해 드리려고 합니다. 어, 우리 경기도와 이재명 지사는 어, 아까 말씀하신 것처럼 기본소득 정책을 폈을 때 저항하는 세력이 많기 때문에 그 저항감을 낮추기 위해서 어, 기본소득으로 지급하는 돈을 특정한 지역에서만 쓸수 있는 지역 화폐로 지급을 했습니다. 아, 그럼 그 지역 화폐는 그 특정한 자기가 살고 있는 도시에 어, 그 도시에서만 사용하게 돼 있어서 그 도시에 사는 사람들, 장사하는 사람들에게 많은 도움이 됐습니다. 실제로 이재명 지사가 있었던 성남시 같은 경우에는 그렇게 해서 어, 성남시의 매출 또는 가게들의 매출이 20% 이상 성장했었던 그런 경험을 갖고 있습니다. 다시 말씀드리면 어, 기본소득 정책을 펼때 어떻게 하면 저항하는 사람들의 저항감을 낮추고 또 어, 국민적 호응을 받고 지지를 받아서 이 정책을 확산할 것인가 이런 것들에 대해서 많은 연구를 해야 될것 같습니다. 그 중에 하나가 우리 성남시와 경기도에서 했었던 기본소득을 지역화폐로 공급하는 정책 이런 것들이 있었다는 것을 소개드렸습니다. 그럼 그 결과 아, 상당히 높은 지지를 확보할 수가 있어서 기본 정책을 더 확산할 수가 있었고 그 정책의 성공으로 해서 지금 대한민국의 여러 시군 많은 도시에서 그 정책을 지금 배워가고 공부하고 있습니다. 그래서 여러 가지 형태로 기본 소득 정책이 확산되고 있는 중입니다. So I would like to say something about the question which was raised a while ago about whether it can only uh, benefit the campaign in the election. Or it can damage. So I would like to say that in uh, our case in Gyeonggi province, when uh, uh, Governor Lee Jae Myung uh, started the campaign, he was not the governor, rather he was a uh, city mayor. And uh, at that time, he he had some resisting uh, people over there. So he did one thing: he chopped out a new strategy. And as for the strategy. He just convinced some area organization to support uh, the people, and uh, the supporting money could not be used outside the city. So all the business people got benefited from that, and uh, they supported it. So their transaction increased by 20 percent. So they started uh, supporting this because money is not going anywhere, uh, and this is how he uh, gained. Popularity and he extended the program, and consequently was elected the governor of the province. So it can be uh, utilized, and uh, uh, some research is needed uh, in order to enhance uh, how to curb these resisting powers. So if you, we have good strategy, then we can easily tackle these sort of resisting powers. Angelica Merkel, she simply sat down and she didn't move because the discussion in Germany had taken over at that time, I suppose. Mark Rutte, when he was young, when he was 20 years, 27 years ago as a youngster, he was in favor of basic income. But nowadays he looks at the polls and he says his electorate is 60% against. So they say, right wing liberals, it's free money and free money doesn't exist. And then I answer, everybody in Holland, 60% in Holland, have their own house. And you get a tax deduction, a real important tax deduction for having your own house. So that's free money too. Oh no, that's something else. But the public is then on my side. So they're so afraid they don't dare to send any MEPs or members of parliament to discuss with me anymore. So they lost the discussion. And about... 
and Mist and Zuckerberg, we don't mention them. And if you mention them, it's negative. Because they're rich people and they don't they don't do anything for basic income. That's what it's, so if people five out of six people have heard of basic income and they have an opinion. And if they have never heard of basic income, I said it's the same as an old age pension, huh? because we have that already 50 years and everybody knows what it is. We say it's the old age pension for everybody. And then these in a minute, people have never heard of the idea, understand the core. Of course, it's a bit more complicated, but that's simple enough. We don't need to, to name this or other famous people. There's an information. 2015 December, in a conference about human rights, I spoke about the advantages of the basic income. The mayor of uh, Marika, a city that today has 153,000 inhabitants, said, I want to establish the basic income in Marika. And he really started. And this August, one third of the population started to receive what is equivalent to $35 per, per month by the end of 2020 and from 2021 the 150,000 inhabitants a little bit more perhaps are going to receive the system's basic income for law. This is a very important uh, it is true that Marika has some advantage relatively to others because uh, it is in front of the <clears throat> a Petrograd space that provides royalties from the oil exploitation. But it's a very important beginning. Second, I would like to make a suggestion to Jan. Next March 21-22, Pope Francis will organ is organizing a meeting in Assis in honor of St. Francis of Assis. And he is inviting especially the young people until 35 years old to be there, but also some people like uh, Amartya Sen and others that may help in counseling what should be made. You know that Pope Francis are, uh, he is uh, counseling all heads of states to institute the instruments of economic policy that will create justice in order to have peace. Well, I am sure that the unconditional basic income is one of the main instruments of economic policy to build peace and then build justice to have peace. And so I would recommend Jan to be present and to uh, promote a dialogue with Pope Francis uh, directly in order to consider the basic income as one of the instruments that will uh, organize a new world order with justice and peace. Thank you, just so uh, Larry, did you want to say anything to any of these questions? So I'll go really quickly. In the United States, it makes a lot of sense to talk about political leaders and, and people from both sides of the political aisle as agreeing on basic income. A lot of people are sort of tired of thinking that it's only one side versus the other side. So when you find out that people you may disagree with politically in a lot of other, a lot of other areas find some common ground, there are some people who actually get a little freaked out by that. They think, well, how could I agree with someone who I disagree with on a lot of other things? How could we agree on this? But it's really important in the United States to have people hear about that. It's not necessarily, although it is helpful to have some wealthy people come out in favor of it, because in America that does carry some weight, especially with celebrities as well. But I think the really impactful stories are those who are sharing that they voted for one candidate or the other in the past, and now they're voting or they're interested in voting for Andrew because of his policies. And finding out that people on the other political side are also doing the same, that's finding some common ground and actually bringing some peace and, and cooperation 
with people who wouldn't normally cooperate. So that's been really important. As far as <laughs> and in terms of speaking about a utopian idea of a full basic income, when Andrew's plan, he has made it very clear what the costs are and explained how to pay for it, what the mechanisms are to make it happen, why it would be necessary. He's very clear about those uh, propose, about the proposal. It's a thousand dollars a month, and he explains it as freedom dividend because it tested better uh, that statement in terms of how people receive the idea. That's why he calls it the freedom dividend, even though he also tells people he named it because of its importance to people how they perceive it. So he is in favor, I believe he's in favor of it growing over time and not to, and to index it to either inflation or productivity. But really the focus is on having that target be that starting point, be the conversation starter, fully explaining how to pay for it and why it's so necessary. And then when people get on board from that, we'll then transition to, and as we grow and as things produce prosperity and peace, we will be able to increase that basic income and have it grow over time because we will have provided that basic income for everybody. Thank you very much. Okay, I have one uh, announcement to make, which is about the next uh, concurrent sessions. Um, the Shame and Sigma of Poverty, uh, which is CS15, that will now be in room four. And the, the session on the, de the definition of basic income will be in room five. Okay, that's for technical reasons, so we have to do that. Again, these discussions here are always too short, and we always want to get more people involved, but there's never quite enough time. But I really want to thank our panelists. <laughs> thank our panelists for their time and their efforts. I think their presentations were very good. They gave us a lot of things to think about moving forward. And for those of us who are involved politically and trying to actually make basic income happen in our various nations, um, I think we have a lot to discuss over, over lunch and dinner and, and the next day that we have over the Congress. So I want to thank you very much.